Shalom, shalom, friends. Welcome and thank you for being with us. I know many of you are going to be accessing this from the Facebook Live and, um, and many from the recording. So we appreciate you being here with us today. Manny Wax, born in 1976, is an Australian activist currently based in Israel. He was previously part of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Australia and later became known for his activism against child sexual abuse in the global Jewish community. In 2011, when he was vice president of the executive, when he was vice president of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, Wax publicly disclosed his own sexual abuse as a child at Melbourne's Yeshiva Center. He founded Voice CSA, an Israel-based organization combating child sexual abuse in Jewish communities worldwide. Wax assisted the Australian government's Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse and investigating the Australian yeshiva centers of the Hasidic Chabad movement of Judaism on their handling of child sexual abuse cases. There's much more I can say about him and his good work and his recent book, um, but I'm gonna hand it over to him. I wish I could say this topic is timely uh, because it is timely, but unfortunately it's always timely. Um, and so this is uh, crucial for us as a uh, modern Orthodox community at Uriel Tzedek and as a Jewish community at large, and as humanity for us to learn about, be aware at, aware of, and be advocates of. I'm sorry my video is not working, but um, I know you can hear me okay. So um, we, we will have the chance to hear from Manny now, um, and then we'll take questions and, and conversation from the, from the Zoom and from the Facebook Live. And we hope all of you enjoying us on YouTube or on SoundCloud. Um, are also uh, appreciating this experience. Thank you for joining us, Manny. Thank you so much for having me, Rabbi Shmuley, again, and um, certainly uh, greatly appreciate all your hard work on these uh, sensitive and difficult issues. Um, it's a great opportunity, and of course, uh, for those uh, who are listening in, uh, it's obviously, as Rabbi Shmuley said, uh, a, a sensitive topic, difficult topic, so uh, please make sure to look after yourselves uh, when you get the chance. I thought what I'd start is by, um, for those who don't know my stories, just to share with you a little bit about my background um, and my experience of abuse, uh, and then about my work and then opening it up to uh, questions. I'll try to leave as much time as I can. I uh, grew up in an ultra-Orthodox environment. Uh, my dad's Australian, my mum's Israeli. Um, of Yemenite um, background, hence the dark skin. Uh, I'm one of 17 children, uh, the second oldest boy, and that essentially means that there are additional responsibilities. Um, you know, as, a, as someone who had many young kids under him, uh, was always responsible for children at a young age. And uh, we grew up, um, lived mainly in Melbourne, Australia, and we went to the Yeshiva Center in Melbourne was uh, our community center from every sense, uh, from the perspective of school, uh, synagogue, youth camps, youth movement activities, everything that was the hub of our life. And um, you see teachers, you see uh, fellow students, both at the school, but also extracurricular activities. So it's a very close knit uh, community at the time, at least I thought uh, a community that uh, looks after each other. When I was around 11 or 12 years old in the late 1980s, uh, I was at the uh, Yeshiva Center and um, what I now know to, uh, to have happened to me was called a grooming process. One of my abusers, the first one, Volvo Sorobransky, um, he was the son of one of the main shluchim, the head emissaries to Australia. And uh, he used to read the Torah in synagogue every Shabbat. Um, so someone who many in the community would have known. Um, the grooming process uh, takes a number of, um, it could take a number of different, uh, happen in numerous ways. For example, uh, a child who's uh, yearning for love, attention, uh, perhaps monetary thing, 
uh, all those types of um, issues um, uh, that, that a child may be going through, um, I think it's uh, a very complicated um, situation to be in, especially when you're not you're not listening, uh, you're not learning anything about um, sexual education, you're not being exposed to those outside of the community. Um, but basically after that process, and in my case, in Bob Sobranski's um, case, he gave me a lot of attention, also gave me access to drive his car in, in some backyard area at the age of 11 or 12 years old. Uh, so from my perspective, I just went along with everything. And then uh, basically on uh, Shavuot night, when it's uh, customary for um, Orthodox Jews to stay up, certainly um, males um, in the Orthodox community stay up all night on Shavuot to study the Torah. Um, usually that's done in the synagogue. Um, so during that time, again, I was 11 or 12 years old, uh, I decided to take a break upstairs in the women's section because there weren't any women there. And uh, as I went upstairs, I noticed someone was following me and I, in the, initially I didn't know who, but then I caught wind of who it was and something felt wrong. So I hurried up the stairs and saw someone was um, uh, sleeping in, in the area there, um, resting one of the uh, fellow students from the school. And uh, I thought I'd go lie down beside him because that's just the safer thing to do. And I quickly went there before the door even opened um, with Velvel coming in. I just wanted to be, um, pretend that I'm asleep almost. So I quickly lay down, um, closed my eyes and a minute or so later, Velvel was there sitting next to me. I was lying down. He was kneeling um, beside me and he initially started to caress me on my clothes. And um, basically the situation became uh, more serious. And as he started to molest me or even just opening up the, uh, my belt buckle um, and the like, then he said, whispered into my ear, something along the lines of, this isn't an appropriate place um, for, for this. And basically started going outside and uh, I followed him. And we went to the women's bathroom uh, where the abuse escalated. I won't go into any of the details, um, but suffice to say, it was a very traumatic experience, especially for such a young child who didn't know exactly what was happening. Um, but I did, at the end of it, I just remember leaving in a state of confusion. Uh, my parents' house was around the corner. Um, so I went home, didn't really say anything to anyone about that until a, um, for a classmate of mine at the time, he came over for a sleepover to my place and I shared it with him. And what that caused is that when I went to school over the next few days, I was being called um, a pufta, which is the equivalent of uh, a faggot in America, a derogatory term for gay people. And part of the reason for that is because there is in many circles, and there certainly was, and now it's to a lesser degree, but still does exist, um, this confusion between, within the ultra-Orthodox community between uh, homosexuality and pedophilia. It's almost uh, one of the same in some of these circles, and certainly back then it was. So here I was being sexually abused by Velvel, and at the same time, and it was ongoing, it happened uh, more than once. Um, it happened a few more times until I uh, basically made it known to him that I just didn't want it anymore. Uh, and basically, I just never, uh, never really caught eyes with him ever again or you know, tried to avoid him to the extent that I could. Um, soon after that, about six months later, uh, David Cypress came along. David Cypress is a, uh, he was in charge of security at the school, at the synagogue, at the whole center. He was also a karate teacher. Um, he was someone who was in charge of dealing with anti-Semitism uh, in our community. So just someone, especially as a Chabad um, man that he was, uh, he was someone for, uh, 12, 13 year old boy. Uh, and at the time I was 12 years old when that started with, um, uh, with, with, with Cyprus, um, then 
it was someone who we looked up to and wanted to be someone like them, you know, the black belt in karate and can be strong and tough, but also ultra orthodox, uh, ostensibly anyway. So he um, started off uh, molesting on, on a couple of occasions. He started off again, the grooming was, he allowed me to be next to him often. And I was kind of his sidekick um, a lot of the times. And, um, but eventually the molestation started initially was on the clothes. And again, it escalated with him. It was many, many times um, over a couple of years. And it culminated with uh, when I was about 14 and a half years old. So it went on for about two and a half years. Um, it culminated with a, a serious incident inside the male mikvah. Uh, for those who don't know, a mikvah is the ritual bath where um, in some cases, women go for the monthly um, uh, time after the period, menstruation, but men, Hasidic men, and certainly myself and my family, we used to go to the mikvah daily, every morning before synagogue, and some occasions twice a day um, before Shabbat and the like. So it was a very spiritual place, a very important place, um, meaningful place. And to have someone from your community and someone in a position of authority and power um, come and, and desecrate the mikvah and you uh, in that place was obviously something that um, left additional trauma, I guess, on me. I didn't share it with anyone because after what had happened in the first case uh, with Velvel, people um, basically uh, made fun of me because of that abuse. So I decided to keep mum about it and just not to say anything. Uh, but as it turns out, people actually found out and knew about both of those abuses. Um, to cut a long story short, basically uh, in response at the time to the abuse from the age of about 11 or 12 when the abuse started, uh, while I was never a model student um, and um, you know, certainly was a, was, a, was a child and you know, used to get up to no good occasionally, my behavior definitely changed both at school uh, and, in the, uh, and in the home as well. Again, being the oldest boy, the second oldest overall, I became the nightmare at home and at school, uh, constantly being kicked out of classes, um, getting in trouble with my parents, et cetera. Uh, in response to that, basically my community, my parents, my, the, the rabbis they used to speak to, because uh, it's important to remember that in these communities, uh, when someone has a question, of their, uh, in terms of wanting to know what to do about a certain um, issue, or it could be as broad as should I be working or should I be going to study Torah all day or should I, all those types of things you ask a rabbi. And in that, those, that case as well, my parents sought their, um, the advice of, of these people. And um, it was decided to withdraw me from uh, general studies, general school, and just to focus on religious studies. And that's what I did from the age of uh, about 12. Um, and of course, I was still being kicked out and in and out of the different yeshivas in Melbourne and Sydney. So it wasn't a particularly great period that I remember. Um, but ultimately, I waited till the age of 18 to uh, make Aliyah. Um, at the time, I didn't really necessarily understand it, but I just wanted to get away from my community, my family, from my surroundings and and just move move away. Um, and of course, in, in some ways, and again, in hindsight, the, the need to go to the Israeli army, uh, perhaps to prove something to myself, you know, some of my manlyhood may have been uh, taken because as an abuse uh, victim survivor, um, I've, I've seen that also amongst others who have endured these types of um, abuse, uh, ultimately trying to reclaim their manhood. It's often by um, getting involved in military or police. Uh, I did that, and in, this was in uh, 1994 when I was 18. Um, I served in the army, and then in 1996, when I was still in the middle of the army, um, I was 20 years old, I went back to Australia to um, my, for my sister's wedding for a one month break from the army. And I happened to hear on the radio that there was a police operation um, on specifically targeting the issue or addressing the issue of child sexual abuse. And that um, basically triggered me to uh, share with my dad 
Um, I would never actually disclosed it to my mum. I remember that time, as soon as I heard it on the radio, I went downstairs, shared it with my dad. Um, he was taken aback, shocked, however, um, whatever words to use, but uh, certainly to his credit, uh, he did something that many in the Haredi world don't um, do, which is he actually he supported me and believed me and um, asked, um, he just wanted to kind of confirm that what I said was he actually understood what I was saying. And um, from memory, within a few days, uh, there was a police, uh, there were detectives there taking a statement and um, basically uh, the process that I, to justice, the road to justice commenced, or at least that's what I thought. And it turns out that at the time, Bobo Sobransky was, uh, my first abuser was already in New York and this is pre-internet days in the mid nineties. So it wasn't quite as simple as that. And my second abuser, David Cypress was still in Australia. They went to interview him. At the time it was his word against uh, my word and he denied anything happened. So the police said, we're not gonna uh, close the case, but uh, we're just gonna leave it uh, open pending further information, further evidence. Uh, and at the same time, around that time, I went to uh, the head rabbi, Rabbi Groner at the time, the late Rabbi Groner, and he was aware of what was happening. He knew what I was talking to him about uh, and who I was referring to without even needing to share too much information. Um, and he basically said to me, there is no need to, uh, to do anything about it. I'm dealing with it. He assured me that he personally is dealing with it um, and, 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 I understood that I don't need to do anything else about it, but clearly uh, it was obvious to me that things needed to be done. Um, but after the, the response by the police and by Rabbi Groner to my um, attempts to pursue justice, to ensure that there is some safety for children today, because at the time David Cypress was still in his same positions of uh, security in, in, in the whole center, um, giving classes, etc. Every nothing had changed. And um, I was very, very angry. I didn't realize that, again, in hindsight, that it was difficult for me to go back to Israel. I ended up coming back uh, late. I had to pay a penalty for those types of situations when you don't go back to the army on time. Um, and at the time, I didn't disclose even to the army. I came late. Why did I have to, why could I be in Australia for as long as I did? Why didn't I return on time? But I didn't share any of that information. And of course, that cost me uh, as well. I had to go to a military prison for uh, being AWOL. So those were very tough times and it took me a long time to recuperate. Um, I returned to Israel, finished serving in the army. And then in the year 2000, I um, returned to Australia, this time for, for good. Um, the intention was, even though I'm currently based in Israel, uh, but um, from 2000, I went back and I thought, I'm going to try to get my life back on track and, and, and see what we can do. And, and that's what I tried to do. And the problem was that every time I used to walk past the Yeshiva Center, which is across the road from my parents' place, um, I used to see, I often used to see David Cypress uh, standing there. And often when I used to walk past um, with my then girlfriend or now ex-wife, um, we used to walk past the main Yeshiva Center entrance and David Cypress used to stand there and literally smirk at me and smile. And to me, always um, kind of conveyed the message that we both know what happened, but I got away with it. Uh, he just never took his eyes off me. We just kind of eyed each other and it was just a terrible kind of feeling. Um, disempowerment, helplessness. So it was a very tough period. Um, and again, I remember in 2000 or 2001, soon after my return, I went back to Rabbi Groner. I met him and scheduled an appointment in his office. Um, and I said, Rabbi Groner, you know, what's, what's going on? This is uh, unacceptable. And um, he again said to me, he personally is dealing with it. Uh, in fact, there was a, he added in this time that there was a therapist that uh, he was seeing psychologists and, and Groner himself is in touch with them. So he understands that uh, he's making improvements, et cetera. But, I asked Rabbi Groner, can you assure me that, and can you be sure that he's not re-offending now or that he won't re-offend in the future? And he said, no, I can't. And that's when I stormed out and that was the end of the conversation with him. Um, I kept the anger to myself for a while, um, but it used to happen quite regularly. You know, I had some, some issues around alcohol and, and the like. 
So uh, unhealthy ways of, of, of dealing with the, with the anger, frustration, um, a, a lot, and the trauma, I guess. Uh, it's important to also add, I guess, that especially in the, in the Haredi world, um, certainly in my community at the time, uh, there was never uh, encouragement about going to therapy. Growing up, the thought was, the belief was that if anyone's going to a therapist, it's either because um, they're weak or they, they are really crazy, they have issues. Uh, so it wasn't something that I was you know, entertaining uh, the thought of uh, going to a therapist. Um, I caught up in my studies, uh, the year 12 equivalent and went to university, got my Bachelor of International Relations um, and then got my first um, main job as the head of the Anti-Defamation Commission in Australia, uh, which is the equivalent of the ADL in, in the US. And that was really the first time that I understood the power of the media and the possibility that I can actually share my story with the media because I'd gone to the police and that was unsuccessful. I'd gone to Rabbi Groner and nothing was happening. So, uh, and I knew that there were other victims by um, David Cypress in particular. Um, so I just felt that if I speak to the media, share about this, um, then something will happen. The problem was that at the time um, we started having children. So 2004 had my first kid, 2006 the second boy. And, um, and that's when the idea, we started talking about it. And I decided with my then wife uh, that we wouldn't, um, that I wouldn't pursue anything publicly. And the main reason for that is around the issue of stigma. And it's, it was a taboo topic, um, you know, this is 15 odd years ago. And she was, and we both were, worried primarily about the children if they go to school and um, kids will know about it. it it could be an issue and raise issues for them so we want to protect them the best way we could um, in um, 2000 so then we decided not to uh, in 2009 or so i started working for the australian government in counterterrorism and at the time I continued uh, my volunteer work with the Jewish community and I was the vice president of the executive council of Australian Jewry, which is um, the national organization for the representative organization of the Jewish community in Australia. And at some point there were a few things that happened in uh, um, that would go up to 2011. But at that time in 2011, I felt that if I have a uh, senior position, leadership position in the Jewish community, uh, I need to address the difficult issues. And if I'm not going to talk about this issue, then who is? Um, because I felt like I could talk about most things and I was more progressive, et cetera. Um, again, to cut a long story short, I decided to speak out publicly. Uh, it was front page news in the Age newspaper in, uh, on the 8th of July, 2011. And basically, I guess my world changed in a significant way uh, on that day because it, caused a ma major stir in um, initially just the local community and the broader Jewish community in Australia. And then also um, it, it caused some waves elsewhere in the world, especially in the Jewish world. Um, there, were, there were positives and there were negatives. The positives were within a, 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 over the next few months, the police were saying that they were receiving um, dozens of calls. They were saying at one stage about three calls a day on average from the Jewish community um, about a range of cases not just uh, David Cyprus, but in relation to David Cyprus, my second perpetrator, they received around 15 allegations, 15 different people who said that he had sexually abused them as well. Um, again, I'm gonna to have to cut um, a fair bit short so I can uh, go through the story and then re respond to questions as well. But um, there were uh, 12 who went through a court uh, process, uh, ultimately through a plea deal he ended up being convicted in relation to nine victims, myself included, um, including um, five charges of rape, uh, the rest of them being indecent assault and all variant, um, a, a variant of uh, these uh, similar crimes. He got jailed for um, eight years in total uh, and not long ago he got released. And then as soon as he did get released, um, he got rearrested for new cases. But other positive things that happened, again, there were, you know, in Maccabi, for example, in Australia, which is not the ultra-Orthodox community, um, other victims came out about it, a coach. And again, he was convicted and jailed. 
um, but not just in Melbourne, in Sydney, there were also a number of cases and elsewhere. Besides from the actual uh, you know, accountability and justice, there were also uh, important changes in the way we as a community spoke about this issue. There were, for the first time ever, people were talking about the issue of child sexual abuse. I remember in the beginning, just talking about my story and using those words, child sexual abuse, people didn't know how to respond. You could see uh, a strong level of discomfort, just not knowing how to talk about it. So the conversation changed. Parents were now realize that they actually need to talk to their children about this issue in an age appropriate way. Institutions realize that they need to address this issue much better. Um, so suddenly policies and procedures became the norm uh, in all these institutions. So it was a great, um, you know, a, a different landscape um, after 2011 than it was before that disclosure. And that was very positive. And I, certainly at the time I was getting a lot of support from people, well done for speaking out, but also from with the rabbis and, 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 and some others. But then at some point where people had enough talking about this issue, um, it was more like, Manny, you've said what the issue is, now you need to be quiet and let justice go and, and run its course. Now, on the one hand, that sounds fairly, you know, that sounds okay. You say let justice uh, proceed and, and all of that. But the problem is that there were still people afraid to come out. There were still uh, cover-ups happening. There were still all these things that were going on. Uh, so I couldn't shut up. But those requests soon became very vicious and malicious, and not just against me, but also against my family, um, whether it's my, my parents uh, or others, whether it's direct or indirect, uh, on blog posts, uh, etc. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time. I know also my parents uh, were a part of the Chabad community there. Um, that was our community uh, pretty much for most of our life. And um, suddenly they were being shunned, literally shunned. Uh, my father even got physically assaulted inside the synagogue. Why? Because they supported me. Um, and my mother it was very particularly difficult for her because she was also the president of uh, Neshe Chabad, the women of Chabad. She was very heavily involved, even though she has uh, 17 kids and was uh, uh, just incredibly hard worker, but she gave a lot of her time, we used to host guests from the community and from anyone who used to come from around the world into Melbourne, into the Chabad community. Uh, the, the Chabad leadership knew they can always turn to my parents to, um, to host guests. Um, so from being very much a, a strong part of the Chabad Melbourne Jewish community um, to being complete pariahs. And that was very difficult for all of us. Ultimately, um, my parents decided to make Aliyah, to leave Australia um, as a result of this. And soon after, I also had to leave Australia with my uh, now ex-wife and kids. And uh, that was a very difficult period um, where it was, it's just thinking back about it, um, just gives me some uh, um, horrible feelings because it was literally myself and my family, or at least some of my family, um, being attacked and criticized, not just by the yeshiva community, not just by Chabad, but also by others who the leadership of the Chabad community were able to bring to support them. Um, I better rush through it a little bit more because there are a few important points to make uh, in terms of the progress and, and, and what's happened over those years uh, subsequently. It, uh, some of you may have heard about the Royal Commission in Australia, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Um, that's essentially an initiative by the Australian government to address the issue, not just of finding perpetrators. It wasn't about finding a perpetrator. It's more about the responses by institutions where allegations were made. And that was, that was officially launched in the uh, um, end of 2011, 2012. It was, again, after I disclosed my story as well. So this was obviously becoming a much broader issue, not just in the Catholic Church, where we had seen that already for decades, uh, but then there were other groups such as the Salvation Army and other um, religious and non-religious groups, and then suddenly some from the Jewish community, and that became a big issue as well. So it really allowed the Australian government to look at this in a much broader way, and they decided to have a look at uh, all these institutions. Um, they selected some, and at the time, I decided to, I established an organisation in Australia called SEDEC, uh, before Voice CSA, 
and um, the role was to give a voice uh, and support victims and, and survivors and their families as well. So I ended up leaving my job, focusing on this full time. Um, and I worked with the government, lobbied with the lobbied government to ensure that the Australian Jewish community would be looked at as well in terms of how it responded. And as a result of that, um, the Yeshiva Center in Melbourne and Sydney, uh, where they both had uh, numerous cases of abuse by multiple uh, abusers, and they decided to look at them very carefully. And what happened was in uh, early February uh, 2015, there was a two week uh, public hearing into the Yeshiva Centers in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, there were four of us victims who, um, who testified. I was the only one who showed his face. The others were uh, anonymous. And, and, and it, was, it was, I don't know, spectacle is, is the right word, but it was just, uh, it was on display for the entire Jewish community and the world, because it was also live streamed from inside the courtroom about what had gone on from the, uh, within the Jewish community. Rabbis, leaders from the community, in particular from Chabad and, um, and the rabbinate, the Australian rabbinate, which was at the time, certainly still today, uh, mainly led by Chabad. Um, they were all hauled in before the Royal Commission, cross-examined. And as a result of that process, um, everything, I was essentially, um, uh, the, the truth came out and people understood uh, that I'd been vindicated and, and I wasn't exaggerating and what had happened um, was not just the abuse itself, uh, but subsequently the re-abuse by the institutions um, and, and the rabbis in particular um, had taken place. And it was just a, a terrible situation to be in. But the vindication was really powerful because for the first time ever, um, these rabbis, at least some of them, and some of these leaders publicly apologized to me and my family um, there were a lot of crocodile tears there. Um, simply, you know, they, uh, they had plenty of time to apologize, uh, but suddenly they were forced and, and, and everything, all eyes were on them and they uh, essentially apologized there. Um, I was subsequently, uh, letters of apology were written to me by uh, even the Executive Council of Australian Jury for their um, terrible behavior at the time. Their president, uh, my former colleague, Danny Lamb, was someone who just behaved in the most abominable way, um, but not him. There were many others, the, the chief rabbi, equivalent of chief rabbi of Australia, who was the president of the um, organization of rabbis of Australasia, Rabbi Marshall McClugan. He was forced to resign. Uh, he lost all his roles and jobs um, because of his personal involvement in trying to intimidate my family. Um, so there was a whole list of them. And as a result of that, also the issue was sent the board, um, mainly the entire board uh, structure that they had to go through a restructure. Um, basically everyone on the board who had been on the board had, uh, had, had resigned, forced to resign, except there was one Rabbi Groner Jr. who still, uh, until this day, is on there in, in remarkable way. I still don't understand all that. But um, the Royal Commission essentially shone a light on what has been going on in the Jewish community. And it's essentially nothing different from what we've seen in the Catholic Church, what we've seen elsewhere. Um, in, in, if we look at uh, what's, what went on with uh, Dr. Larry Nasa with the um, US Olympics team and, and, and the gymnastics, um, hundreds, hundreds of victims by this one doctor. And it turned out many people alleged and heard about it, and, but no one actually did anything about it. So um, that's a, a great learning curve for, for, for all of us in terms of what needs to be addressed um, moving forward as well. And after the Royal Commission, um, I still, I, you know, in exile, and I still feel in some ways in exile, even though we're now uh, based here, um, there, there was that process of, um, of, of trying to pursue justice and, and to change, um, uh, not just for myself, I'd already succeeded in doing that in relation to Cyprus. Um, I can tell you that uh, in relation to my first abuser, Verbal Sobransky, the police is still, it's under investigation officially, so um, it takes a very long time apparently. Uh, for those interested on the, um, there were two documentaries uh, um, about my story, Code of Silence and then Breaking the Silence. Um, those cover both my personal story initially and then the broader story of what happened in the Royal Commission um, and a little bit beyond that. 
um, and those are available uh, publicly. Um, and at that time, I decided to focus globally. Um, and that's what I'm doing now with Voice CSA. Uh, initially, it was called for Oz, um, but we wanted to change it. So we initially started working in 2016 on this new initiative, um, been registered in Israel here in 2018. And in the last uh, couple of years, been working hard there in terms of uh, trying to shape the way the global Jewish community addresses the issue of child sexual abuse. Um, it means, for example, pre-corona, of course, uh, traveling the world, Jewish communities, meeting up with uh, leaders in the Jewish community, in schools, boards, parents, teachers, um, all of that, to try to make them aware about the issue, educate them, empower them, um, to try to have that high level of influence on these communities so that we can get the conversations right. And besides from uh, raising awareness, um, we also uh, address the issue of advocacy through, and what I mean by advocacy is trying to change some laws. Um, for example, the New York Child Victims Act, uh, we brought together a, a broad Jewish coalition and joined a non-Jewish coalition as well to change that law. Uh, for some of you who may know, in, in some US states and at the time in New York as well, when a, a victim a survivor turned the age of five years after the age of 18, in most cases, they would not be able to pursue justice um, simply because of statute of limitations, uh, pure technicality, legal technicality. Um, so that changed only by a few years. Um, at least uh, in terms of uh, criminal cases and civil case, but there was a window opened up for civil cases to be uh, to be able to sue institutions and individuals. And that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that window just closed not long ago after extension, uh, a couple of extensions. And, um, and certainly there were quite a few cases in the Jewish community, mainly what, what we're aware of in the uh, Haredi community where uh, many lawsuits were launched. Um, and one of the other roles that we uh, focus on in Voice CSA, aside from the uh, focusing on awareness raising and on uh, advocacy, we also try to bring together organizations um, who work in this field in their local Jewish community through conferences, workshops, um, advice and the like, uh, and obviously COVID has made things a little bit more tricky and difficult, but we had a conference in New York in 2017 where we had around 50 uh, participants from 17 organizations from around the world, whether it's in Mexico, um, South Africa or, or elsewhere. Um, and also in Israel recently, we had something similar. Um, it's, it's important because it is a new topic. It's a, it's a sensitive topic and an issue that we address it in the uh, most appropriate manner and to ensure that victims and survivors are heard, believed, uh, etc., cetera, and, and, and have the support mechanisms that they require in place and also their families to address it. So that perpetrators also are aware now that they're, they're on notice, that they cannot continue to offend with impunity, that that will be held to account uh, because the situation has changed. Children are more educated around these issues. Parents are talking to them. Schools are, are much more aware around these issues. So those are the three key areas that we focus on in Voice CSA. And of course, um, we do rely on donations. So if anyone is in a position to uh, get onto our website and support us, that would be greatly appreciated as well. Um, but ultimately it's trying to, uh, to change the way, it, not just in the Haredi community, beyond. Um, as I said, I've been to places such as Mexico or South America, um, in particular, where I experienced in, in Brazil and Argentina, they're even more behind some places in the world where I visited, including Israel. And Israel is a lot more behind from Australia. So there are all sorts of different um, uh, frameworks in which to learn from, um, because Australia has taken the lead in terms of addressing this issue globally. Uh, but um, Israel is doing a fair bit, but as we can see, uh, there's a long way to go. And in Israel, I can say what we've seen in the last few years in particular, um, there have been many cases of um, sex attacks by, by, by multiple perpetrators against younger children, uh, whether it's happening through schools or whether it's happening online where people are meeting. Um, so there is so much more work to be done. 
Uh, before we open up the q and I'll just say uh, briefly about the recent cases that people, uh, you know, as Rabbi Shmuley was saying uh, about the timeliness of this uh, talk. It's, uh, I imagine he was referring to the context of Rabbi Chaim Walder, who is, for those who don't know, uh, a major figure in the ultra-Orthodox world. He was considered a, uh, a, a, an expert about um, addressing these types of issues. Um, his books were read in, in, in most Haredi homes. Kids speak about speaking for children. Then it was, um, uh, it was uh, basically uh, noted through a media article initially in Haaretz that there were three allegations against him, um, that he sexually abused um, women, children. But soon after that, dozens uh, of more allegations surfaced, including recently there was even a bet then um, uh, because some of them were statute of limitations issues and other issues, uh, for example, many in the Haredi world don't want to go to the secular authorities. So even Abedin found that there were 22 victims, both uh, women and girls, who uh, came to the Abedin, and uh, and that that story also, um, for those who remember, the previous um, scandal, similar scandal, was Rabbi Yehuda Meshi Zahav, who was the head of Zaka, uh, which is a, a really a, a respected um, voluntary organization here in Israel. He also. Uh, multiple allegations against him. And another similarity between the both of them is that they both tried to commit suicide in the case of, as soon as the heat uh, became uh, significant. In the case of Meshi Zahav, he's uh, still in the hospital in a coma. And uh, in relation to um, Chaim Walda, he killed himself and um, essentially left his victims um, um, no opportunity for justice. Um, and he denied everything until his last breath, uh, even with the letter he left. Um, it raises all sorts of other questions that we could get into if anyone has the questions about when, 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 what's right, what's wrong, et cetera, and there is not necessarily always a clear cut um, answer to this, but um, one of the important notes that I want to end with is people have been saying, it's great to see in the Haredi world, they're talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. Initially, the Haredi world did come out and say, well, this is terrible. Uh, but then the, the situation very much changed for all sorts of different reasons. Um, when he did die, he took his own life. People were starting to blame the victims or the rabbis who pushed him to do it rather than blaming him for his actions. Um, uh, when, when, he, when he was even noted that he, would, he, had, he had died, there was no mention of the abuse in the Haredi newspapers and media. There was no mention that he had killed himself. Uh, it was just a rabbi and that he was a holy man and, and all that. And just imagine how his victims feel. And just imagine how, how other victims in the Haredi world, what they think, what they would think about um, going to make allegations to in the Haredi world. Uh, in my view, while over the last decade or so, just like in broader society, we have seen immense progress in broader society, also in the Haredi world. Part of the problem is that the Haredi world started a, a much longer base than the broader society. So they've got a lot more catching up to do. But as I noted now, even with all the progress they've made, they are still so far that, that, that they've got, they're causing significant damage, continue to cause damage. And of course, I'm not talking about every Haredi community or every Haredi person. There were so many good rabbis in the Haredi community and many, many community members there who were doing great work. But as an institution, as a broad Haredi community, there is so much work that needs to be done. And there is and the statistics, and we're lacking a lot of the statistics because it's a closed community. But some of the uh, statistics that are based on anecdotal evidence, at least, is, has been absolutely shocking, horrific, especially in the Hasidic community, for example, where mikvahs have been a free-for-all, the male ritual bath. They go every day and there is often no policies and procedures and often there is just uh, student, uh, children and adults at the same time. But anyway, I I'd like to leave us um, about 15 minutes for Q&A, so I'm happy to open it up for questions now. Thank you so much, Manny, for your strength, for your vulnerability today. Um, my question to you, and I've had the honor to meet you and, um, you know, spend some time here with you. 
But my question to you, Manny, is what does justice look like to you? Oh, that's a very good question. I think the first way I would respond to that is that to me, you added the important word to you because for every victim and survivor, um, they've got their own perception of justice. Um, my sense of justice wasn't about uh, trying to put my uh, abusers to jail. That's, it's about, for me, what's important is accountability. It's about bringing the matter before the authorities, let them decide what they want to do. Often you hear uh, people saying justice, oh, you know, excuse my, my language, but string them by the balls, kill them, etc. And people need to understand, I talked about my story, most abuse happens not within an institution, it happens within the home. And therefore, if you're saying we should kill these people or ostracize them, and etc., these are people's um, grandfathers, uncles, family members, that they don't necessarily want them to be strung up and, and, and ostracized. They just want accountability. They want them to say sorry. They want So every person is different. For me, I tried, um, and, and there's a, not just the justice about my two perpetrators. For me, there's also the importance of justice for those who were involved in cover-ups and in the intimidation. And, and, and I'm very grateful for the unique um, opportunity to actually hold my second perpetrator to account and also to hold the institution to account where the abuse happened through a civil case. I know most people don't get that opportunity um, and I'm certainly still hopeful that I'll be able to uh, hold to account my first uh, perpetrator. Thank you friends, feel free to unmute yourself or ask a question. Yes, Hal, go ahead. Thank you, I'm calling from Canada. Uh, Ottawa. Uh, thank you, Manny, for your wonderful presentation. Do you have an update on what is happening with Lev Tahor? Oh, okay. I don't really have other than what's been reported in the media. Lev Tahor is the most fringe of the fringe group. And, you, you know, I mean, obviously they were in Canada previously at some stage, but, um, you know, I think we should, we should try to separate them and what goes on there. Um, with most of the Haredi world, because even by Haredi standards, they are extreme. We're talking about child beatings, child marriage, uh, complete distrust, and, and 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 not looking at any um, have any any respect for the legal authorities in any country. So they are unique. At the same time, there are certainly those ingredients uh, that exist within Lev Tahor that exists within, for example, the Satmar community and then the Gera Hasidim and other Hasidic groups that are also extreme, not quite as extreme as that, but on issues of sexuality, they can't even talk and mention the word sex. So if you can't say the word sex, how are you going to be able to explain what is appropriate, not appropriate in the sexual context? Some of the words they use are modest or in, in modest touching. And, and what does that actually mean, being immodest and modest? The, to many people, it's like, you know, you, got, you can't wear a shirt up until a certain stage and et cetera, you know, the length. Um, so those are, are fundamental problems about the issue around education, around language, around trust of their own fellow community members. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Manny. Uh, my name is Kimmy. I'm from California, but I'm currently based in El Salvador. Um, I've had the opportunity to do some really great learning with uh, Orila Sedex. So thank you so much for being here. And um, this is something that I'm very passionate about. I've worked in child care and in childhood education for many years. And um, just something that comes to mind, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this is, so much of the there's the element of justice and then there's also the like the understanding from the perpetrator that what they did was wrong and very often there's the denial there's or there's excuse making or shaming and blaming but what can be done to to create understanding within the perpetrator's mind that what you did is not okay um and just about any anecdotes that you have around that yeah, no, I think that's an excellent question. And, um, and, and that's an issue that's arisen. Also, it's related to the first question that Eddie asked, which is about what does justice actually look like? Um, and the reason I say it's connected is because there, there are other models, for example, the concept of restorative justice, um, which is essentially, you know, it's not going through a court process. It's about, in some cases, it could mean uh, meeting with the perpetrator and sitting with them and explaining to them what's happened, what did you do, why it's affected me, how has it affected me? And then they get to understand. So 
in that context, I certainly understand um, that, that, that that could work um, in terms of influencing. Uh, in, in one of the, uh, in the conference in New York in 2017, I actually invited a convicted pedophile to come to this talk to speak to these organizations because most of them have never really met a pedophile and just dealing with the victims and survivors. And it was, it was a learning point for, 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 for many of us. Um, part of the issue is that they, some pedophiles at least, don't quite think what they did is wrong or, um, or they don't really understand what they did is wrong. Um, I would say if you, there's, uh, I, was, I mentioned earlier, there were two documentaries made about my story, but there's a third, not quite a do full documentary, it was an article, but it featured in Hebrew, where I went to New York and I confronted my first abuser, Belvo. And this was all filmed in an undercover um, film, a reporter who was there and we caught it all. I ended up speaking to him for 20 minutes. Um, and part of the thing was, if you watch that engage, our engagement, he just didn't understand what he did was wrong. He was saying that he loved me. Um, he was infatuated by me, those are his words. And that he thought he was taking the lead from me as an 11 or 12 year old boy that he was in his early to mid twenties. Um, it takes two to tango, that, that's, that was what he was saying. So I don't think you can ever really explain things to a real pedophile. And the reason I say real pedophile is because people also need to understand there's a difference between a pedophile and a child molester or child abuser. Because the difference is, and, and I'm no expert in this field, but um, as I know, because I'm not, not a psychologist but, or a psychiatrist, but what I've been told is that a pedophile is essentially the sexual attraction to pubescent boys uh, or children. And it's not always the case that a pedophile is attracted to a, 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 to a child, sorry, that, that a sex offender is, is doing it because of pedophilia. He may be doing it because of control, because of psychopathic or other reasons. Whereas conversely, the pedophile, you may be imagining it, fantasizing about it, but a pedophile may not actually be an abuser. Uh, may not may, and then may not actually go out and carry that fantasy out, and that's why I'm also of the position that we need to provide support. Firstly, primarily, of course, to victims and survivors, but we also need to provide some support, some advice to 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 potential perpetrators, to pedophiles. And I know Germany has a, a, a serious. Uh, program uh, focusing on that, and it, in the US there are some things around that, but we can't just say, oh, pedophile, we can't just treat them. And part of the problem is no one's going to come out and say, I'm a pedophile, I need help, because that is the lowest of the low in our society. Everyone knows, even if you go to prison, you don't want to disclose you're a pedophile. So something needs to change in the way we address this issue. Again, not just in the Haredi world, in much broader society, because we need to, um, to, to break down some of these barriers so people can go to seek help uh, and get support, et cetera. Thank you so much. That, that was along the lines of what I would because the issue will continue to repeat itself unless you get, we get to the root. And of course, there's a lot of psychological intervention that needs to take place with that, but very often not to give too much credit to, to people who commit these crimes because it's a crime and, and justice must be served. Uh, and there's no justification for it, but a lot of times people who commit those kinds of crimes have experienced it themselves or suffer, or suffer some kind of trauma, yes. mental thing themselves. And so um, it's it's a very difficult, it's all of difficult, but um, just, yeah, just thinking about that as well. Yeah, it's not, but you're right. It's, it's, it could be a cycle as well, ongoing cycle of, of both victims and perpetrators and, and, and um, until people actually get the help they need, until they there's awareness. I mean, look, we're breaking uh, down these barriers more and more every year. We're back a decade ago, as I was saying, even I used to say the words child sexual abuse, people didn't know how to look at me as I'd go, what's what do I do? How do I respond? And now, child sexual abuse is okay. People are talking about it. But if you talk about mental health issues, as a result of the abuse, for example, uh, people don't know how to respond. What does that actually mean? That oh, I got depression, anxiety, PTSD. So the, 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 there is so much education around all of these issues um, that we, in terms of prevention, how to prevent abuse, how, and then the intervention. What do we do when we actually suspect these things are going on? And then the final third one is really about support. 
What, how do we support? What? Thank you. No worries. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Looks like that's coming up on our time. Manny, we deeply, deeply appreciate you and your advocacy, your strength. It is something that I look up to. I know uh, we will be sharing uh, with everybody who's watching this, participating, we'll be sharing more ways to keep in touch with Manny, keep in touch with all of his work and his beautiful advocacy. And I, I love what you said, Manny. What does justice mean to you? And the way that you responded it is an individualistic take. But that relies on the fact that we are able to have these conversations and that work is being done by you. Thank you so much, Manny. Thank you, everybody Thank you. watching. Thank you to everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.